Good afternoon, and welcome to this year's masterclass. My name is Ellen Mortensen, and I'm the academic director of the Holberg Prize. The masterclass is an event that aims to establish contact between the Holberg laureate and young doctoral candidates from the Nordic countries. We have therefore announced a competition among PhD students from these countries who have competed for a travel grant to come to Bergen during the Holberg week and take part in the masterclass led by the Holberg laureate Cass R. Sunstein. Professor Sunstein has chosen the topic, what to do about human error, which he will shortly introduce. But before I give the floor to Professor Sunstein, let me introduce the six doctoral candidates who have been chosen to take part in this year's masterclass. They were selected among about 50 Nordic applicants. We have asked each of them to prepare a five minute presentation on the topic, and I introduce the participants in the order in which they will be speaking, following Cass Sunstein's introduction. The first one out to my left is Axel Steri, who studies ethics or applied ethics at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Oslo. The second one out is Matthijs Maas from the University of Copenhagen uh, in Denmark. Uh, he uh, is studying technology, governing, and politics. And the third one out is Jar Jarno Tuiminen from Finland, the University of Turku, who is a PhD candidate in psychology. The fourth one out is Valgerdur Sulnes from the University of Copenhagen and the University of Iceland Faculty of Law. And Reykjavik, as you know, is in Iceland. The fifth one out is Max Carlin from the Faculty of Law at Lund University in Sweden, who studies public law. And the last one out is Esdramalda Esmeralda Colombo, who is a PhD candidate here at the, at the Faculty of Law at the University of Bergen. Now, let me introduce Professor Cass Sunstein, this year's Holberg Laureate. Cass R. Sunstein is the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard University. He is also the founder and director of a Harvard Law School program in behavioral economics and public policy. Professor Sunstein has published close to 50 books, 48 published and three in the works, I have been told. He might produce one while in Bergen, and hundreds of academic articles. After the rights revolution from 1990 and the partial constitution from 1993, count among his most influential works on constitutional law. He won the Goldsmith Book Prize for his book, Democracy and the Problem of Free Speech in 1993. And together with Richard Taylor, <coughs> Thaler, is it Thaler or Taylor? Thaler. He is the author of Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness from 2008. The book deals with how private and public organizations may help influence individuals making better choices in ways that may enhance the quality of their lives. In addition to his wide-ranging academic production, Cass Sunstein has shown great social engagement and he has taken active part in public debate on a number of current issues. Professor Sunstein has also been involved in constitutional development and law proposals in many countries. Between 2009 and 2012, he was administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, where he was involved with the regulation of issues ranging from security, air quality, civil rights, transparency in public affairs, climate change, economic freedom, health, and a fight against poverty. Professor Sunstein, the floor is yours.
Well, uh, my thanks, uh, really my deepest thanks uh, to Ellen and everyone here. Uh, this is a fantastic honor and the generosity and kindness I've experienced both uh, in the last 24 hours and in the uh, preparations for the trip are uh, on a scale of one to 10, the generosity and kindness are 11. Uh, I'm acutely aware having been here for uh, about 24 hours that um, while all of you speak very elegantly and your English accent is charming, mine is barbaric. <laughs> and, and I can hear myself saying, I can hear, my, it's terrible. But that's how I talk, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to the, my co-panelists with whom I had a wonderful lunch just now and uh, for your effort and your, and your work on this. And I'm extremely excited to, to hear from you. Uh, so I thought it might be um, uh, organizing, I guess is the right word, uh, to give a quartet of possible answers to what to do about human error and to give a sense of their intellectual ancestry, uh, where the answers are respectively nothing, revolution, regulation, and architecture. And I'm gonna say a little bit about all of these ideas. Uh, the great um, thinker behind the answer to the question what to do about human error is with only slight caricature, uh, John Stuart Mill, who in his magnificent essay on liberty uh, insisted that the only basis for coercion uh, is a case of harm to others. And if people are making mistakes, then there is no basis for third party intervention. Now on Mill's account, there's a, a justification for this principle, which is actually an empirical justification. The idea is that a person deciding what to do today, tomorrow, or for the next decade is in the best position to know what's in his or her interests, and an outsider will lack the knowledge which the actor has. And even if the outsider has a lot of knowledge, the outsider lacks the information about the particular person's particular decision, whether it involves, and here we're extrapolating, uh, where to live, what to eat, um, what to do on vacation, or anything else. And so for a slight caricature of Mill, the appropriate answer is nothing. As we were discussing a bit at lunch, there's, I think, an intriguing autobiographical reason for Mill's answer, which has to do with his personal life, where Mill's book on liberty was, in my view, uh, importantly influenced by his own choices with respect to a very controversial, let's say, romance. Uh, the word romance is accurate, there's no shall we say in that. The word controversial is shall we say because it violated existing norms. Harriet Taylor was married. His relationship with his family disintegrated because of his relationship with Harriet Taylor. And his insistence on the illegitimacy of third party intervention and that the actor knows best, the agent knows best what's his, in his or her interest has a great deal to do, I believe, with his personal experiences. A um, later theorist of the answer nothing is Friedrich Hayek, who in a remarkable uh, statement said the chief argument for liberty, the chief argument for liberty is the ignorance of outsiders, which was saying that the individual knows best what will promote well-being, and so the answer what to do about human error is essentially nothing. Okay, the second answer, revolution, we're going to associate with Karl Marx, but I'm going to give it a, a more analytical foundation in the work of uh, Norway's own Jan Elster. So the Marxist idea of false consciousness insists that a certain very important, maybe most important category of mistakes are because uh, people don't know what's in their best interests, 
because their beliefs about what's there in their best interests are a product of background injustice. So if you live under circumstances of, let's say, pervasive injustice or deprivation, your preferences and values will be an artifact of those conditions, which suggests that human error of the most fundamental kind requires not nothing, but something very strong, revolution. Now, in Elster's formulation, and this is one of the great ideas, I think, in the past 50 years, the way to understand Marx's claim is, to, is through the term adaptive preferences. And then the idea is a universe of preferences, including those of women under conditions of sex inequality, uh, poor people under conditions of economic deprivation, are uh, based on adaptation to an unjust status quo. And when preferences are adaptive to an unjust status quo, the status quo cannot be justified by reference to the preferences, because it is responsible for them. And that uh, tradition of thought, which has a home in some places of, uh, in some non-Marxist traditions, says the thing to do about human error is actually very dramatic, which is uh, large-scale changes in social circumstances. Okay, the third idea, regulation, I'm going to associate with the British economist Arthur Pigou, P-I-G-O-U, and this is using Pigou as an exemplar of traditional economic thinking about human error, which often has found its place in legal systems. And the idea here is that if people are making mistakes, the reason is that they lack information. And that is the, not just the iconic, but the exhaustive account of mistake. And the response to mistakes that stem from lack of information are basically to provide them information, or if that's for some reason not feasible or inadequate, provide them with the outcome that they would choose were they informed. And you can see many legal systems uh, as seeing their, in their principal business as ensuring against error through information. It might be on a can of Coca-Cola, or it might be on a medicine, or it might be in an airport, or it might be in a store, where you inform people to prevent mistakes. In cases in which mistakes are nonetheless to be made, because information's too complicated to transmit or too costly to transmit, we should have a regulatory intervention, maybe in the form of a mandate or a tax, which provides people with the outcome that they would themselves choose were they informed. And that is, I think, a close cousin to the Mill answer, but it is, uh, let's say, a younger and more rebellious cousin than Mill himself. Okay, I'm going to look at the fourth and final solution to the problem of human error, uh, the one that involves architecture, and I'm going to get at it through a story. There was, uh, during World War II, a problem in the United States, which many of the bombers returning from bombing, bombing missions crashed. They would come back from missions, and then the pilots would crash the planes. Why was this? A lot of them were crashing. And a psychologist was asked to figure out why the returning bombers were crashing. Was it that the pilots on particular missions were under stress? Is it that they were under fire? Is it that they had been inadequately trained? What was the psychological reason for this pretty catastrophic error? Crashing planes, expensive as well as catastrophic. The psychologists looked at the errors and studied them carefully and discovered after an extended period of time, there was no problem with the pilots. They were not under stress. They were not insufficiently trained. They were not having any kind of psychological problem. They certainly didn't lack information. The reason for the crashes was the cockpit was poorly designed. The thing you pull to land the plane uh, safely was very proximate and physically identical to the thing you pull to fly the plane. 
So if you're flying the plane, there are two things right next to each other and you can't tell them apart. Under very difficult conditions, you know, you're in a war, people would sometimes pull the wrong thing. And so what the psychologist said was, it's a cockpit problem. Redesign the plane so that the landing gear is physically separable from the other gear. That was done and then the plane stopped crashing. Okay, the view which I'm suggesting, and I think you can probably tell this is the one I'm most excited about, is that human errors are often a product of the cockpit problem. We attribute the problem to something in human psychology or in information failure, and that might not be entirely wrong, but the problem of design is at the heart of the error, and the solution to the problem is better cockpits. So if you're following the suggestion, the suggestion which is meant to be a rebuttal in whole or in part to Mill, for sure, to Marx also, though he would not find it satisfactory, but to Marx too, and to Pigou and the standard economic view, is that all over human life, worse in some places and in some nations than others, but all over human life, there are cockpit problems. And the solution to human error is not revolution. It's certainly not nothing. It's not even regulation. It's in the standard sense. It's better cockpits. Thanks. Well, thank you for your talk, and um, I hope my talk will be in the cockpit uh, category. Uh, my talk will be an applied exercise, uh, and I want to explore how we can use behavioral insights to improve our relationship with drugs, including alcohol and nicotine. Uh, more specifically, I want to show how a drug app could be a useful libertarian paternalistic tool to regulate the use of drugs. And this can, of course, be taken as a policy proposal that can be implemented tomorrow, or as a way to illuminate a more general way to think about how we ought to regulate drugs, but also other goods. I think the topic is a low-hanging fruit for behavioral interventions. You have drug prohibition today, and this is both extremely harmful and excessively paternalistic. Not all drug use are irrational, unreasonable, or excessively harmful to third parties, so we should not assume that prohibition is justified. But neither will the laissez-faire approach work. We certainly have a problematic relationship with drugs. And this is due to several, several factors. You, of course, have a present bias where you get a reward from the drug right now, and then you have costs later on. And this, of course, increased by the fact that we might, in a cold state, think that we will have two beers this night. And then, after consuming these two glasses of beer, then we will have one more and one more and one more. So we change our preferences during the consumption of the drug. Uh, you also have endogenous preferences. So it's not like we have some kind of some externally given uh, preference for drugs. Uh, our preferences for drugs are, cha are shaped in, in part by group pressure, of course, but also the social norm in society as a whole. And in alcohol research, it has been shown that the abuse of alcohol uh, rises proportionally with the level of consumption of alcohol in the population as a whole. You also, also of course, have uh, addiction. More, many, many drugs are addictive, and, um, and uh, this is, in a way, uh, a trap from your present self to your future self uh, that makes them uh, be stuck in a, a, a situation they do not want to find themselves in. Some of these biases, uh, along with the external costs, could be corrected for by taxes, and you could justify these taxes by either economic efficiency or John Stuart Mill harm principles, but also some kind of uh, help to yourself. Uh, but don't believe taxes are sufficient. Uh, they only target some of the human biases, and they are not individual, uh, individually uh, adjusted. So that is why we should consider a drug app. Uh, the drug app will work as the way to access drugs uh, by restricting access to those that have this app. So you need this app to buy drugs and to track your consumption over time. And this can also work as a channel for communication. And I think this brings with it many benefits. 
And controversially, this app can let you track your own consumption over time, so it gives you an honest look at your own drug consumption that we don't have today. And you also have a chance for the government to nudge. So if they can, in a way, track your drug consumption over time, they can give you different nudges, and they can give you different gamification of these nudges. And of course, they can follow if you have really dangerous drug uh, behavior, they can nudge you into seeking help. Uh, and of course, you can provide, provide information about what drugs, drugs not to mix, uh, what uh, side effects you have from drugs, and what lo long-term harms you have from drugs, and also what drugs that do not fit with certain health problems. More controversially, perhaps, uh, this app could also be used to limit your ability to buy more drugs. And this could, of course, include a straight-out paternalistic element like they had in the Swedish BRAT system uh, in the 1950s, where the government set a maximum level. So when you have bought all the drugs that you are allowed to have, then no more drugs for you. Some people will probably say that this will create a black market and also find it too paternalistic. So there's another possibility, uh, and that could be to use the app as a way to self-regulate. And as I see it, you have three obvious possibilities. You could have a daily maximum, where you restrict your daily uh, consumption level in a cold state. So if you go out and think, okay, it's only going to be two glasses of wine today, then that's your maximum li uh, level. And when you find yourself in a more hot state, you have drink uh, drinking two glasses of wine already, then you won't be able to buy more uh, alcohol that day. Uh, you could also have pre-commitment to being drug-free for a couple of weeks or months or whatever, and in this period you won't be able to buy drugs at all. And probably you shouldn't be able to regret that decision before the term has ended. You could also set your own taxes on this drug app, so you face different costs to different drugs, so you already have taxes set by the government, but you can then ad individually adjust the taxes to set your own, so you internalize your present self, internalize the costs to your future selves. I believe this could have a uh, libertarian paternalistic uh, addition to it. Uh, it could be combined with a government set default. So, when you download the app, this will be the level that is set for the different drugs. So if, if we make it difficult to change, then that will be, uh, that will be uh, due to inertia, it will be difficult to change, but it can also be an important signaling effect from the government. I will end by just one last... <laughs> because on the government side, this drug app could also be used to get really important information about the drug behavior from, uh, from uh, the consumers. It could be used to gather big data to uh, find out what nudges that work and what, what the nudges that doesn't. And of course you can use machine learning to gather information about very dangerous drug uh, behavior patterns that eventually lead to drug abuse. So you can, uh, could uh, get some um, uh, information about when to intervene at an early stage. So yeah, I'll uh, end there. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about drugs. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to make a more theoretical, maybe a more sweeping statement in this short time. First of all, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me and thank you for Professor Sandstein for uh, participating. So, uh, I'd like to start by redeeming errors so that, uh, like, well, Let's start from the beginning. DNA has one thing to do. It's supposed to replicate faultlessly. Uh, unfortunately, something goes wrong, and then it leads to mutations, which leads to evolution, which leads to uh, single cell organisms moving to calm jellies and to presidents of the United States and to us all here. So no, no need to sort of downgrade errors. They are very useful. Uh, but of course, there's a continuum of errors from a scale of harmless to a scale of potentially catastrophic. And when we are in the catastrophic range, we talk about existential risk, which are things like climate change or nuclear disaster or nuclear war. And I'm not going to go deeper into that. I'm going to return to that in the end of my, my short talk, but to just tune you into thinking about these larger scale errors that have massive con uh, consequences and where 
in fact, libertarian paternalism might be even more justified than in, in these more harmless cases. <clears throat> but then, to what to do with human errors? So, I thought I'll spend my time to talk about what to do with errors in general, because uh, there's a theory called predictive coding theory, which is to do with errors, which says that every, every self-organizing organism in the world must create an internal model of the world upon which it can make predictions or expectations of the future. So then it, and by making these predictions, it can navigate successfully in the world, it can survive and it can uh, move its genes along. And what it does, it creates and what all of us do, according to this theory, it's based on Helmholtz's theory from the 19th century, but recently been going on in the name of or the guise of predictive coding by Carl Friston. It states that we create an internal model of the world with all of the expectations on it, and then we see whether our expectations match with the external world. And when there's a mismatch, this is termed a prediction error. And what, is, what follows is that the error is uh, sent onward to the system and then it tries to uh, make way with the error. So it can do this in two ways. One, it changes its model, so it changes the expectations it has for the environment, or it can act on the world, so it can change the world to fit the internal model. And very briefly, my suggestion is that in the case of existential risk and human error in general, uh, we should think in these terms, whether we can change the way we think, what do we expect, and also how to change the world. And for this specific topic on human errors, of course, our errors are very useful. So we have several uh, like very known errors and heuristics and biases that we make in our reasoning all the time that I think most of you are familiar with. And uh, for, for these are also geared toward our uh, benefit. So when you ask, for example, United, uh, drivers from the United States, are you better than average? This is done by Swenson in the 80s. If you ask whether you are a better driver than average, 93% of people say that, yes, I am better than average, which, of course, is not the way averages work. And then we also are, uh, have for example, optimism bias here, so we think that we can continue smoking without the risk of lung cancer, whereas our neighbor continues smoking, there's an increased chance of, of his lung cancer. So we underestimate the probabilities when they are to do with <coughs> negative consequences related to us. So uh, to conclude, my point will be that what we should do especially in relate, relation to existential risks, on how to gear our inbuilt errors, which are useful, ubiquitous, necessary, how we can use those to mitigate the risk for existential risk, how we can, for example, build the choice architecture in our surroundings, how we can create policies in a way that mitigate the risks for, for example, climate change. So I leave you with that. Thank you. So, uh, hi all. Um, so, my name is Matthias Maas. I'm a PhD fellow at the University of Copenhagen, where I focus on the responsible governance of artificial intelligence. And so, the, the topic today is what to do about human error. So, it may be a bit weird for me to start talking about AI, about machines rather than humans. And of course, it's been, it's been suggested it's possible that AI can serve as a cure to human error in the form of improved nudging tools that uh, help us both better understand the choice architectures uh, under which people uh, labor, and also alter these architectures through tailored uh, non-normative, but also non-coercive nudges that are improved by our machine learning. However, today I want to discuss some limits to any AI-enabled algorithmic paternalism uh, by highlighting three levels at which AI technology provokes, absorbs, or interacts with human error. So the first of this is the um, uh, the policy level, so human error about AI. Second will be the, um, the sort of systemic or the design level, so where it's about uh, human error in AI. And the third will be the operational level, where it's about human error with AI. So 
starting with the, um, the strategic, the policy-making level, much of the debate around paternalism, whether libertarian or otherwise, uh, also revolves around the concept that even if policymakers are also just human and, and boundedly rational, that there are still policy areas in which they, uh, their judgment of uh, the state of affairs or a group's interests can be better than that group's uh, judgment itself, that they can have a good judgment of risk. I want to argue that this may be true in many cases, but it's not the case in where it comes to assessing artificial intelligence or other emerging technologies. Um, this is because specifically uh, with AI, policymakers themselves are hampered by a number of cognitive biases. Now, there's too many to sort of discuss in detail, but they include uh, what's called contamination and anchoring effects from popular media depictions. As a result of this, uh, policy and public debates around AI are often based on misconceptions, misframings. They look at peripheral issues, such as uh, the, the famed uh, robot rights. Um, there's also availability bias, so that we look at sort of recent incidents when estimating risk, but we don't extrapolate from experienced small hazards in cyberspace or AI failures to larger risks later on. Um, whether it's sort of in failures of nuclear deterrence or, or uh, yeah, uh, AI systems applied to nuclear deterrence. And so all of these biases, including uh, uh, effect heuristic and calibration bias, they're all exacerbated in the, co in the context of AI, where we have sparse advanced information and policymakers are already on unfamiliar technological ground. And Informing policymakers about many of these biases only rarely serves to alleviate them. So this is the first point. It's this cognitive bias, the policymaker human error, that undercuts the accuracy uh, or skews the accuracy of cost-benefit assessments on the risks of AI. Secondly, um, it's the um, human error in AI. So as is discussed, AI could be a powerful tool for mapping human interests and improving our nudges for citizens. But this creates three problems. The first is that uh, human error can infect uh, AIs. So machine learning has been called uh, industrial strength stereotyping. Um, and it's quite easy for human bias to sort of seep into the trading data sets. Hard for us to find it, especially if it's unmarked. And so this, this bias becomes reproduced in systems of algorithmic governance, paternalistic or otherwise. And that's a problem because these systems do provide or create a veneer of objectivity that may lead the regulators or the public to trust the judgments of these systems more than they should. And that could be problematic if these are judgments by biased systems in, in diet advice or in dating websites. Um, another problem involves transparency, which is that black box neural networks cannot really provide a rationale for individual decisions. We can see pre perhaps ex post statistically that their judgments are biased, but we cannot often understand this in advance, and often we cannot understand uh, how they're optimizing for a metric that we give them. And that's a problem because policymakers, if they use a machine learning system, for instance, to test or to, um, to iterate over nudges, they cannot really tell what aspects of the situation a machine learning system is acting upon or altering, or what values it's sacrificing in order to optimize for what we want. And that makes it very hard to spot harmful nudges to where, that, are, that are harmful to welfare. And finally, so because AI systems learn the behavior of citizens, so that is the revealed preference, not our stated or, or claimed ones, their use could constitute what Cornell called an insulting expressive content. Because not just are we saying that we as experts know better than, than you do what you want, we're saying that our computers know better than you do what you want. Finally, thirdly, at the operational level, AI systems are particularly prone to what are called uh, normal accidents. And these are unpredictable system accidents that emerge uh, when systems are complex and tightly coupled. Okay. Um, and this, this happens because humans trust the system too much, um, and it's essentially a cockpit problem, as has discussed by Gus since then. So in sum, I've articulated three ways in which AI systems can provoke, absorb, or interact with human error. I have no solution to them, but we should think about this when we're discussing AI governance or algorithmic paternalism in general. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you here in Bergen. Uh, my name is Valkerer and I'm a lawyer from Iceland. Thank you for having me. 
Uh, I want to contribute two points to our discussions today. My first and main point has to do with the applicability of the professor's scholarship on liberal paternalism in the Nordic states. My emphasis will be on applicability, not implementation. To my understanding, uh, the scholarship is set against an American backdrop, which operates under liberalist notions. Uh, in this context, the freedom of choice is fundamental and prized. If we look to Nordic societies, uh, we immediately see how they are premised on a different notion as they are meant to function as welfare states. Uh, in such states, uh, the government plays a somewhat larger role in society in robustly protecting and promoting the social and e economic well-being of its citizens. Uh, as a result, welfare states extensively interfere with the lives of their citizens in a somewhat paternalist way. Uh, I can attest to this as a citizen uh, and an educated lawyer of a Nordic state, Iceland. Despite the fact that set the Nordics apart from American society, I have been contemplating whether the scholarship could be applied in the interest of the Nordic states. This is where I came to focus on not only how, the, how people are affected by human error, the government is also affected by human error, including regulators. And what's more is that the government can become liable for damages caused by human error at the regulatory level. If the Nordic approach is applied, uh, where the government severely restricts or, or often takes away the freedom to choose, the government can become liable for the regulatory choice in question, uh, which means that if human error occurs at regulatory level within the government's own ranks, the government may become responsible for the consequences. If, alternatively, uh, liberal paternalist policies are applied to the government's regulatory efforts, where the right conduct is encouraged whilst leaving choice intact, this would be a less intrusive way than the Nordic paternalist approach generally is. And this second approach would relieve potential state liability in the event of regulatory human error. This is why liberal paternalism is, in my opinion, uh, more proportional than the sometimes intrusive Nordic approach, and the proportionality arguments are twofold. With this regulatory choice, uh, the consequences of human error at the regulatory level are mitigated, at least compared to the Nordic approach, as the people remain in possession of their freedom to decide differently for themselves, which benefits the people and better adheres to their human freedoms, which are guaranteed by the Nordic states uh, at a constitutional and an international level. Also, uh, with this regulatory choice, the risk of state liability is reduced, which benefits the state and also the people as taxpayers. So these two proportionality arguments are, in my opinion, private and public incentives in favor of applying liberal paternalist policies, nudging mechanisms, to regulatory efforts in the Nordics, despite the different social structure. Lastly, my second and very minor point has to do with if the premise of human error should be more extensively anticipated in legal education. Uh, coming from a legal perspective, I'll be discussing this point from the perspective of law schools, where law schools uh, already explore human error somewhat unconsciously, I think, through case law and hypotheticals and such. But should law professors consciously engage with their students in discussions on topics such as responses, damage control, when human error occurs, teach some sort of first aid in order to change the mindset of law students, enhance their skills, and better prepare them for challenging workplace situations. And I, I thought of this particularly in the context of, for example, administrative law, where administrative workers often come across problems like this. Uh, I'll leave it at this for now, uh, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on these two points. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm Max Carlin, and I'm a lawyer from Sweden. Um, some people needlessly feel very uneasy about the notion of governmental paternalism to limit the effects of human error, even in its libertarian form, as uh, suggested by Sunstein. Uh, for example, you sometimes hear people invoke the notion of an Orwellian big brother. 
And uh, my doctoral uh, project concerns local government law in the Eastern Nordic uh, legal system in which cities and municipalities have a very or comparatively uh, high degree of uh, autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the state. And I, I got this thought I would like to try, and the, the idea is, is very simple, and it is that decentralization of paternalistic efforts uh, by government uh, to cities and municipalities, uh, it can ease some of the unwarranted, in my opinion, uh, skepticism raised against uh, libertarian paternalism. And one objection against um, government paternalism, I think, is rooted in a perceived um, unpleasant power dynamic, an inherent sense of superiority and, and lack of reciprocity. And uh, this is due to how people view their relationship with the government. They perceive the government as an authoritarian institution that reigns over them. Um, and in contrast, paternalistic care from a friend or family member is uh, less problematic, as suggested for the, from the reading today. And uh, I submit that there is a phenomenological difference in how we perceive our relationship with the state on one hand, or even the state or the EU, or no, Norway is not the EU member, but Sweden is, and in the American context, uh, obviously the, the federal government on the one hand, and the city and the municipality in which we live on the other. And the relationship you have with your city is uh, more personal compared to your relationship with the state, and the state is much bigger, and it's very much above you. Uh, the center of power of the city is closer to you than the states, and also you are free to move from your city or municipality uh, should you want to, whereas it's much harder to emigrate to another country. Uh, and these differences, differences are relevant to the acceptability of uh, government paternalistic action. Uh, unlike a paternalistic family member, a state can't easily individual tailor its action, but it must uh, act on a very general level. It's big and clumsy, as it says in one of our articles for today. And uh, local governments can ideally be placed somewhere in between uh, the family member and the state government. It's still much clumsier than a family member, but perhaps less so than uh, the state government. And still it is big enough to, to enable policies with somewhat broad ambitions. And uh, also in the, in the local arena, it becomes much more apparent that the creator of a certain paternalistic policy is also subject to the same policy. Uh, so sometimes people in my town will uh, adopt policies that are paternalistic towards me, and then it can go in the reverse, reverse as well. Uh, so the feeling of reciprocity and uh, things like that, that is enhanced uh, on, on the local level, or at least it's easier to, to achieve. Um, we do need protection against bad nudging, though, and uh, the ultimate safeguard against misguided paternalism, I would argue, is the same as for any other bad policy. It, the recourse must be the democratic process. And uh, paternalism obviously may seem very objectionable when uh, the political policy making is non-transparent and remote from, from, uh, from the citizen, and having these de decision making processes appear on the local level uh, I would argue would counteract these problems. Um, even so, some people uh, may reject an official eff effort to steer them uh, just because it is an official effort, uh, effort to steer them. But to me, it seems at least plausible that nudges on the local level would tend to cause less resentment uh, uh, because after all, the paternalism is not from very high above, it's somewhat closer to you, and if you really would object, you can always move to another city. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm Esmeralda Colombo from the law faculty of the University of Bergen. Thank you very much for having me here. So, uh, for some time, I've been occupying myself with the role of courts in climate change matters. Can courts be nudgers? 
can courts nudge, so gently push governments into regulating climate change matters in a fairly accurate way and uh, contribute to the determination of the risk that we are willing to accept. Mm, climate change cases now top number 900 worldwide. In a string of cases rendered in um, the Netherlands, Pakistan, South Africa, Colombia, governments were brought to court upon several allegations, uh, one of um, which was that governmental policies and or decisions were flawed. Our governments do make mistakes, errors. These can be intentional to keep commitments low, or they can be unintentional. Questioning the role of courts in these cases, in my opinion, is important, not just for the outcome of the case, but also because of general doubts on whether states will keep up their commitments made under the Paris Agreement, or whether those commitments are sufficient to keep um, the increase in temperature level well below two degrees Celsius. So, um, what are the errors we're talking about here? They're usually concerned with intertemporal decision-making processes, uh, something that Professor Sunstein uh, examined in that in his works. And um, those are the problems concerning the choices we make today and the impact that will come in the future. So arguments go like, uh, we don't really need to lower emissions, technology will rescue us, carbon capture and storage will rescue us, or even if technology will not rescue us, why do we really need to uh, take into account future generations? They will come up with uh, substitutes, even for food that we will not be able to grow anymore. And this is a fairly established concept in economics, the hyperbolic discounting rate. And we're not criticizing a lot these assumptions. So what are the uh, results in court? Well, these are mixed, um, but uh, there is an increase in um, examination of the accuracy of all assumptions behind governmental policies and decisions. Now, notably in Europe, a case from the Netherlands found uh, the Dutch state liable in tort because it did not take into account seriously enough risks and harms and ignored the findings of the intergovernmental panel on climate change. And the ruling was um, for the Dutch state to decrease its emissions much more than it had planned. So this is the Organda decision. I would like to present Professor Sonstein with two sets of questions. First, should courts decide these cases? And secondly, how should they decide these cases? So to be more specific about the first set of questions, should courts decide these cases? Should they detect any flawed assumptions behind governmental policies and decisions? This is, of course, linked to justiciability, separation of powers principle. And the second set of questions is about how courts should decide. If we answer in the affirmative to the first question, how should they uh, ground their reasoning? Should it be on the basis of the IPCC report, uh, as the Organda Court did? Or should it be on the basis of expert, expert opinions, as a, a recent German case is portraying, so that expert, experts are brought to, um, uh, to court as um, witnesses? Or should it be on the basis of uh, algorithm-based models like in systems dynamics. And uh, uh, the last point is about nudges. Is it possible for a court to frame its ruling in nudging terms? Because courts coerce, and they did so in the Organda decision. What's best for society then? So I'm very um, uh, interested in, in your uh, ideas about that. Thanks.
Okay, so these are fantastic presentations, and I'm really grateful for them. Uh, there's so much to discuss. Uh, let me take them in no particular order. So, uh, and any one of them could be 45 minutes easily. So how much time do you all have? Can you stay up past midnight in this room? Uh, so let's start with Esmeralda. Um, a fantastic issue of climate change and the role of courts. If I may, I'm going to give you four cases, two of which are real and two of which are hypothetical, and these are going to be an attempted answer. Case one, real. Under President Bush, the Environmental Protection Agency basically refused to consider greenhouse gases a pollutant. It said no. The court said, look at the legal definition of a pollutant. Greenhouse gases fit the definition. Given the law, you must explain why you're not regulating greenhouse gases. And the explanation has to be reasonable. And in parenthesis, the court basically said, that's very difficult. That is a nudge in the sense that it is steering the government. It's not a mandate to the government. The government could have said greenhouse gases are not a pollutant. It would have been difficult. And it successfully nudged our government. Uh, and I think the court was right. First question, should the court decide these cases? Here the answer is definitely yes. The reason is the law said you have to regulate pollutants. So whether the court should decide depends on what the law says. And in this case, the court didn't have to answer the second question, what should the law court look to? So I'm going to get to that with my next examples. The second one, it's also real, which is the US government, and I was involved in this, came up with a social cost of carbon, meaning what is the cost of a ton of carbon emissions? Our number was basically $35. Okay, take that as a number. And it was based on the most important scientific work on the subject, which came from Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And it basically used the three models, averaged them, came up with that number. This was challenged in court as unlawful. The court heard the challenge. That was correct because the question was first, is the number $35 consistent with the law? And if it's consistent with the law, is it nonetheless arbitrary? And those are fair questions. The court concluded it's perfectly consistent with the law, and it's not arbitrary because the existing international models support the analysis. Now, that answers both of your questions. I think, yes, the court should hear it. Should it look at the IPCC? Probably, but not only. The question is whether what the government has done is reasonable, and if the government has departed from the IPCC, the question is, does it have a reason, and is it a fair reason? The court is not a scientific tribunal. It should defer to a reasonable judgment, but a reasonable judgment requires reasons. Case three, there's been discussion of the Trump administration concluding, inconsistent with what the Obama administration did, that uh, greenhouse gases endanger public health and welfare. If the Trump administration said that greenhouse gases do not endanger public health and welfare, the court should hear that. The first question is, is it consistent with law? There's nothing in the law that plainly forbids that. Is it reasonable? No. There's no scientific basis for saying climate change does not endanger public health and welfare. So the IPCC need not be authoritative. If there's some other source that's real, that's evidence, that could be looked at. But there's no good reason, aside from you know, outlier views by some people who don't come close to representing the consensus. So look at the science. Defer to the government, which has the primary authority. But if it's not reasonable, you lose. And the government, would, the Trump administration would lose that. And one reason the Trump administration hasn't tried to say climate change does not endanger public health and welfare is the lawyers are saying, don't do that, you'll lose in court. Okay, last question. The Trump administration has abandoned the Obama administration's social cost of carbon. This is a hypothetical case. It probably will come up. The Trump administration will have difficulty defending its decision. It needs to refer to science. 
okay? If the court concluded the Trump administration's abandonment of the Obama administration's number, $35, is unreasonable, it would nudge the Trump administration, I hope, by saying, we, the court, aren't going to tell you the number, but come up with one that fits with the science. And that kind of nudge can be extremely important, and it does preserve freedom of choice. Okay, that's uh, the, the longest answer any of you are going to get. Uh, apologies, or you're welcome. I'm not sure which. Uh, Max, on your point, you make a great point about uh, decentralization uh, as a uh, way of quieting public objections to paternalism and nudges. I have some data for you. It's very recent data. The world it looks like can be divided into three sets of countries. Uh, we now have data from dozens. In, and the list is going to be long, Germany, France, the United States, um, the United Kingdom, Italy, South Africa, Brazil, Russia, Australia, and I'm not going to continue, but in all of these countries, strong majorities of citizens are in favor of nudges and have no objection. We gave citizens a list of 15 nudges, and they are paternalistic, a number of them, and the citizens say, 70%, 80%, sometimes 65%, great, we're strongly in favor. And you have to work very hard to find a disagreement along demographic lines. Men and women agree, people of different political parties agree. Basically, there seems to be a liberal democratic consensus, where I mean liberal nations that respect freedom, like Australia and Sweden is in this group, by the way, also. Very strong majority approval which suggests that the concern about paternalism of the nudge variety is more abstract than it is particular. Do you object to calorie labels? No, people like calorie labels. Do you object to automatic enrollment and savings programs? No, people like automatic enrollment and savings programs. Do you object to automatic enrollment in green energy programs? No, people like that. So across a very wide terrain, we have enthusiasm from the countries I've listed. But there's a second category of countries, and they don't just, by strong majority, they like nudges. They almost, everybody likes nudges. And the countries are Mexico, South Korea, and China. 85%, 90%, 95%. What unifies Mexico, China, and South Korea, I don't know. Probably not a single thing but they are even more enthusiastic. Then there's a third category of countries, which includes Japan, Hungary, and Denmark, where the enthusiasm is slightly lower. Majorities, yes, but not 75%, 60%. Not 80%, but in some cases, 55%. In some cases, it drops below 50%. But in this group of countries, Japan, Hungary, and um, de surprisingly, Denmark, there's, there's considerable enthusiasm, which suggests the data showing that the notion that people don't like paternalism, there's resistance, is uh, in tension with the data we're getting for particular initiatives. And these are initiatives that are national, not from decentralized entities. So my thought is that concerns about paternalism are very strong in the abstract. Whether the concern is real depends on the specific thing that's being proposed. Do you object to a ban on smoking? People, I think, would generally say yes. Do you object to an advertising campaign designed to get smokers to quit? People do not object to that. Anti-smoking nudges, liberty-preserving, people like that. Okay, uh, 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 I'm going to valg, as I, I pronounced it perfectly, as if I spoke Icelandic perfectly and Danish both. Or did I have a slight Danish accent when I said your name? Okay, these are, uh, these are also great questions. Uh, on government error, I love your point that in a system where you have um, a liability potentially that the government will have for mistakes. If you have a nudge, the liability might be eliminated or reduced because freedom is preserved. That's extremely interesting and, and highly original. And uh, thank you for that. Um, 
Uh, it suggests the consequences of error from the standpoint of error-prone government, and several of you have rightly pointed to that, are lower. So that, that's a, a wonderful point. Uh, on the difference between welfare states a la um, uh, Iceland and uh, Denmark and Norway and Sweden and others, non-welfare states, do you mean the United States of America? Maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pondering whether we have as stark a difference as it might seem. I'm just wondering. So the data suggests that the citizens of the United States are more supportive of nudges than the citizens of Denmark. The citizens of Sweden are somewhat more supportive than the citizens of the United States. But these are all members of the same family, basically. They're not disagreeing. You're not seeing cultural differences that are extremely significant. So I'm wondering if it's not about popular opinion, is it about what governments actually do? And uh, interesting question. Uh, in the United States, we're, not, we're required to buckle our seat belts. You're required to buckle your seat belts here? The same. We have very strong cigarette taxes in the United States. Do you have cigarette taxes here? The same. We have laws that say you can't text while driving at the state level. You have prohibitions on texting while driving? We have that too. So what I'm wondering is where concretely are there differences between welfare states and non-welfare states that show a significant difference along the dimension of paternalism? I'm sure there are some, but it would be interesting to concretize and then and then, and then see. Okay, legal education, this is also a tremendous point that it's only recently that in legal educational circles that I'm aware of, human error has been part of the focus of education. And even that is more anecdotal than systematic. Um, there's someone who strongly disagrees with what I just said, who's walking out in protest, and uh, I, was pr I was probably wrong, so you're right. Thank you for being the only one who's walking out in protest. Okay, so, uh, so that, 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 that's, that's a great point on, on legal education. Okay, uh, no particular order. Axel's point about uh, drug apps, that's uh, uh, a very imaginative suggestion, and it's also kind of, uh, impressively forward-looking about the use of technologies uh, both in to enable nudges by government and to enable private sector nudges and to promote a word for what you describe. Uh, I think this is in our book. If it's not, it should be. Uh, snudges? Self-nudges. Snudges? Is, maybe there's a better word? Uh, uh, Self-nudging, where the idea is that you can monitor your own activity, uh, promote uh, pre-commitment strategies, uh, enforce commitments on yourself, be like Ulysses, resisting the sirens. So uh, it's an extremely interesting idea. And uh, what I'm wondering is, uh, it has application to some drugs which either are or should be legal, and so it's an interesting policy proposal. It also has applications to other things like smoking, and um, it's a great way of making theory meet practice. Uh, maybe an inquiry to be done is uh, what exactly, uh, in terms of costs and benefits, do we project? And probably they'd be high on the benefit side and low on the cost side. It's just an app. Uh, so it's, it's a very inventive I idea. Um, uh, Jarno's suggestion of redeeming error, that is also most welcome, that uh, there are a couple of things that are important about error. Uh, one is that uh, it can increase the diversity of uh, of activity that society sees. And John Stuart Mill was all over that. That if you see experiments in living, then even if they go wrong, uh, so long as they're not catastrophic, uh, people will learn from them, and that's crucially important. The other point which uh, you make is that uh, one reason to redeem error is that you learn, and that there's no way for us to learn certain lessons except by making mistakes. And that's important for societies and for individual life. So that, that, that seems very, very important. Um, 
what I want to make a distinction between, I think, is errors that people make that impose costs on others and errors people make that impose harms on just themselves. And here I'm uh, just following John Stuart Mill, with whom I have a very stormy love affair. Uh, and this count, we're having a good week, he and I, uh, on this issue, where if the errors result in harms to others, uh, I think we don't want to redeem them too much because people are um, injuring their fellow citizens on errors that harm themselves, which is what nudging is frequently about. It's about helping people make better choices for themselves. There, uh, there we can redeem error a little bit more. In your case of catastrophic risks or extinction risks, um, I think we want to um, uh, emphasize that those are harms to third parties, typically. The climate change problem, the problem of nuclear war, it's not people are making mistakes for their own lives, it's they're inflicting costs on others. And there, uh, uh, nothing's irredeemable. And everyone can be redeemed. But we don't want to redeem that kind of error. And I think that's consistent with the spirit of what you said. Um, uh, I also uh, love Matthias's introduction of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and his various cautionary notes about AI as a, um, uh, as a friend or instrument of nudging and as, a, uh, as an error correction device. I, I think what I'll do by way of uh, kind of comment on your, your, your uh, points is just give an example of uh, uh, machine learning that is, I think, instructive about the future and about error correction. Uh, and it, it, it's just one story, but, but it's, it gives a more sunny, like today, rather than rainy, like your extremely instructive rainy talk was a raining talk. Raining on artificial intelligence, which is very important because all of the problems are, are real. Uh, but here's a, a, a sunny story, which involves the use of machine learning to, um, to figure out who, which people who've been arrested for committing a crime should be released before the trial. This is very important. Uh, countless people are arrested, sad to say, a number of them are released, a number of them aren't. Some of the people who are released commit crimes, including violent crimes, while they've been released. Some of the people who are made to stay in, in prison for extended periods, their lives are ruined. They didn't commit a crime, they've been arrested, they're there for weeks or months, or in some cases a year or more, their lives are in tatters, and they didn't do anything wrong. So the question is who gets released and who doesn't? Judges make this decision. There's a machine learning algorithm that does better than judges, much better than judges. It does so much better than judges that it could keep the same number of people in jail and reduce violent crime by the thousands. That's a statistic, but we're talking about murder and rape. They would be stopped because the algorithm knows who's going to commit crimes better than the judges. Or if we don't want to reduce crime, but we want to reduce the prison population, we can reduce the prison population by the thousands and keep the same level of people in prison. Or if we want to go in the middle, the algorithm will tell us to do that. Reduce crime significantly, reduce the prison population significantly. The algorithm will tell us all of that. Okay, that is a case where an algorithm may not be perfect, and it may suffer from all of the problems you describe. In fact, it almost certainly does, but it's doing a lot better than people are. Now I'm gonna tell you the part of this research that is so badly buried in the research that it's almost impossible to find, but it's extremely instructive and closely connected with your point. You might be asking, why does the algorithm do so much better than the judges? What does it know that they don't know? What's the mistake the judges are making? Okay, here's the principal answer. You have a person who's been arrested, let's say, for a crime. The crime might be, let's say, a drug offense. Or the crime might be theft. Or the crime might be assault. 
the judge looks hard at the current offense, the current charge. If it's just marijuana use, the judge will say they should probably be free. If it's assault, the judge would say they should probably be in jail. What the algorithm does better is it knows that the current charge is just one data point. What are the charges that person has been subject to the past? Has the person been in jail in the past? What kind of life has that person had in the past? The, the algorithm does not give as much emphasis on the current charge. And that's a key secret to its success. Now, what's beautiful about that finding in this research, and as I say, that finding is so obscure in the, in the, in the pages, you can't find it unless you read the paper 20 times. What's beautiful about that is that the uh, judges are showing a particular all too human bias, availability bias, which you mentioned. The available offense is the current one, but it's not as important as the whole story that the defendant presents. The algorithm, ironically, knows the whole story. The judge doesn't. Nonetheless, everything you said is right. Uh, I've learned a great deal from your presentations, and uh, if I were awarding the Holger Berg Prize for next year, the six of you would get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do any of you have any comments, first of all, or questions back to Professor Sunstein? I might have. Yeah. I might have one. You might have one. Yes. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking, thinking of existential risk. Staying. Could you speak that. up a little bit? Yes. Yeah. Uh, staying with the existential risk for a moment, is that what do you consider to be the, like, because this is of course a very big issue that needs to be dealt with somehow, and the problem I've seen raised in the literature is that nudges might also be a way for governments to avoid doing structural decisions and changing like more deeper issues in the in the policy okay okay great so there are two points there uh, the, the first is what do I consider to be the most serious um, well nuclear proliferation is one and the current discussions with North Korea are uh, revelatory, I think, of the importance of nuclear proliferation as a, uh, a problem that badly needs attention. Um, uh, world hunger isn't an existential threat, but there are many members of the human species who don't have enough to eat. And that's, uh, if you look up the numbers, and uh, Google will tell you in an instant, the numbers are staggering. It's not an existential threat, but it's a very serious threat to many millions of people. Uh, climate change certainly belongs on the list. Uh, I wouldn't put it first as, uh, as the most serious problem that uh, deserves attention right now, but of, of existential threats, it, it certainly belongs on the list. Uh, there's a view out there that uh, uh, nudges divert attention from more aggressive responses to social problems. And how to put this, I worked in the US government for uh, four years. I worked with the US government for longer than that. I've, I've engaged with governments in uh, Sweden and Denmark and Germany and um, uh, Canada and many others. And I, I haven't found a single case where the government said, well, let's not do X because we'll do a, a nudge instead. Never saw that. So it's, much, it's very common to say uh, we have an externalities problem, like the climate change problem. So, le so let's use regulation for that. And let's use nudges too. Or we have a problem of occupational safety. Workers are dying. Let's use regulatory strategies 
that would make workplaces have better cockpits, and also let's use nudges to inform workers about the risks so that they can protect themselves. So the, surely it's true that at least once someone has said, let's use a nudge rather than something else. But uh, it's, uh, it hasn't happened a lot. It's, it's, it's possible. Um, if you use, a, a, let's say, an information disclosure strategy rather than a prohibition, that, that might be a good idea. So for liquor, I'm not a big drinker myself. Uh, anyone in the room a big drinker? <laughs> <laughs> There's an organization out there that can. Uh, but for, for those who are big drinkers and those who aren't, uh, prohibition doesn't seem like a great idea. But nudging to reduce the risks of you know, harm to self and others is, is a good idea. So the, the, I can say from my own government experience, uh, President Obama asked me to do cost-benefit analysis wherever we could, and sometimes a nudge would have very low costs and significant benefits, and a regulatory mandate would have very high costs and even higher benefits, and so you do both. Anyone else? Yes, Lars. Um, so you've... Um, you've described uh, previously sort of the um, so why nudges can fail, and especially the case of counter nudges by private parties or, or private actors. And you discuss, you suggest that well, there's a number of responses you can do. In that case, you can even counter counter nudge, and that's the, the sort of the arms race continues. How do you? Um, Anticipate that this sort of this you could almost call it an offense defense balance, but how does it, this balance between the government's ability to create beneficial nudges and private actors' ability to create profitable nudges, how that balance will scale up or develop in coming years, especially given that private actors might have access to larger data stores that allow them to craft more capable nudges rather than the government? It's a, it's a great question. So the first, I think, issue is whether the private sector is going to be uh, nudging people in a way that's in the public interest or nudging people that's in the interest of the private actor. And uh, thinking uh, here, is, is it the case that many of the large companies are nudging for good, whether the issue involves the environment or equality or consumer value? You're not looking like you're all saying yes. But uh, in my very slight experience with Norway, there are public spirited private actors who are nudging for good all the time. L'Oreal, the international company, has developed a UV patch. It's a little like the drug app and I think there's an app for it, which is designed to reduce the incidence of skin cancer. It's a little patch from L'Oreal. It's a nudge, and L'Oreal is working hard to counteract the risk of skin cancer and save lives. And it's not disconnected from L'Oreal's business, broadly understood. And so that's a private sector nudge, which we don't want to counter nudge to. And the reason I'm going on a little bit is at this is that it's standard, I think, to think of nudging from the private sector as harmful to the relevant community. But that might not be true. Um, there, I've worked with a large international company that sells products to consume that are not uh, famous for being healthy. I'm phrasing it as abstractly as I can. Uh, but the company's leadership is determined in the next generation to move its consumer base toward healthier choices. And it's working very hard to do that. It's hoping that that will be economically beneficial. But if it's economically neutral, the company would do it also. And there are people in leadership positions of the company who would be willing to lose a little money if they could uh, help people be healthier. And they are nudging very actively towards healthier choices. That's part of their business model. Okay, um, I'm thinking as you're talking about counter-nudging, uh, 
does everyone in the room agree that Isabelle Luper is the greatest actress in the history of cinema? <laughs> yes? Isabelle Luper is the greatest actress in the history of cinema. Not everyone agrees? She's one of the, one of the list of top ten. Uh, she's smoking a lot in movies. She's just, I don't think it's her fault. Her part requires smoking. And if Isabelle Luper is smoking in a movie, then some percentage of the audience is going to say, I'll smoke too. I now smoke a lot. It's because of her. No, that's not true. I don't smoke. Uh, but that is a counter nudge. And whether it's part of the, the movie or whether there's some economic deal with the cigarette companies, who knows? Uh, there is, with respect to smoking, a lot of, a, a lot of nudging people to smoke. And with private consumption that's not in people's interests, there's nudging to encourage people to do things that aren't necessarily in their interest. Um, and you raise the specter of an arms race. And it's a good point where the private sector is nudging, then the government is counter nudging, and there's uh, a competition here, and you suggest the private sector might win. It's a, it's a very fair point. And one thing that's happened in the last, I think, even three years is that the private sector is much more alert to behavioral science than it used to be. And they are hiring consultants to help them uh, use the things to which you refer, and probably artificial intelligence too, to try to promote their own economic interest. And that is, that is a, that's definitely a challenge. Now, in a society that respects, as even the welfare states do, certainly Iceland, about which I've learned a great deal in the last, uh, if you respect generally markets, uh, you don't want to forbid private activity unless you have a very good reason. But there is a question, I think there's a fair question, whether the category of false advertising, which is generally understood, and the category of deceptive advertising, which is also well understood, should be accompanied by a category of manipulative advertising. It's a, it's a question. And the idea would be that exploitation of people's behavioral biases might be uh, close to deception or actually manipulation and, and therefore regulable. This seems to me an extremely important area for interdisciplinary thinking where lawyers would play a significant role. So what I'm wondering, I've done a little research on this, but only a little. In what legal systems is there a category called manipulation, which is regulable? And what are the ingredients of the category? Any other questions from the panel before we open up the floor to questions from the audience? We can come back, right? So they well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's open up for questions from the audience. Or comments. Yes. Hello, my name is uh, Toril Notveit. I'm a PhD candidate here at the faculty. Um, my question is basically how law can function as nudges, and then I want to elaborate a little. Ten years ago, smoking in bars and restaurants was uh, prohibited in Norway by a legal statute that went through Parliament. Before that, we had a very vivid discussion and a lot of people found it paternalistic. Uh, and now it's been introduced and 10 years later, less people smoke and more people support regulation. Uh, because Norway is a mixed legal system, we've also got case law regulation. So my question is how, if you've got uh, legal regulation compared to, no, uh, sorry, statute regulation compared to case law regulation. Do you think they would nudge better or worse? Either of the two also seeing the discussion uh, in light of the discussion that will be Okay, held. okay good. So um, let's talk about legal regulation that amounts to nudges through the court system. So my understanding of most democratic legal systems is that the law of contract and property has default 
terms in it such that uh, the parties or people will be presumed to have certain rights and obligations unless they explicitly provide otherwise. And legal systems will not be identical in terms of what the default rules are, but there are default rules. And they're default rules in the sense that the parties or people can contract around them if they explicitly provide that. So the, the court system is pervaded by nudges in the form of uh, presumptions. And uh, what I'm thinking as I look at you all is that in Norway, there's probably a very interesting research opportunity in the identification of default rules in various domains and uh, analysis of, of what good they're doing. Those are common law rules. Okay, with respect to smoking, uh, a nudge might be um, uh, a situation in which doctors ask their patients, are you a smoker? And as, if the answer is yes, the doctor says, well, we automatically enroll people in smoking secession programs. That's our practice. Um, you're in unless you want to opt out. That's, I th that seems to me like a very interesting nudge. And uh, uh, I know there's been talk in some medical practices of adopting it. Uh, smoking prohibitions in uh, hotels and restaurants are beyond a nudge. They're not merely statutory, they're also prohibitions. And they might be justified. There's an externality issue where smokers might cause harm or offense to non-smokers, but there's also a paternalism issue there. Uh, as between the court system and the statutes, which is, I guess, the force of your question, the advantage of the statute is it re represents the will of the public, and so it has a democratic pedigree. The advantage of the court system is that it's typically an incremental development of a long-standing set of judgments. So uh, forgive me if, in, if this is showing my ignorance of the Norwegian legal system. Uh, I do, I know the word talk, and I can pronounce the word talk, talk. But, that, but my understanding of the legal system is extremely weak. Uh, but I'm going to elaborate just for a moment. You can see those who would emphasize the uh, legislature, the statutory solution, whether it's a nudge or more, as preferable as linked to the work of Jeremy Bentham, who thought of the court system as uh, amateurish, uh, undemocratic, uh, uninformed, and stumbling. And, and for some legal systems, Bentham's right in his enthusiasm for statutory processes. Uh, his great opponent is Edmund Burke, who thought of the legal system, the judge system, as wise in the same way traditions are wise. That is, the principles and rules are built up over long periods through careful encounter with details. And that would be a point for the court system. Uh, I'm thinking that for most of the public policy problems that we've been discussing, whether it's about uh, you know, uh, large-scale environmental issues or uh, relatively smaller questions uh, than climate change, uh, the kinds of things decentralized organizations, institutions are dealing with, uh, the legislative process has advantages. That it, it does have the democratic pedigree, there's a fact-finding capacity. The judges often won't have an ability really to penetrate the issue. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Vogt. I'm a PhD scholar at the Department of Philosophy here at the University of Bergen. Thank you for a very interesting uh, session. Uh, I have a question about the example you had uh, about the judge and the algorithm, the algorithm example. And uh, at least for some types of crime, socioeconomically deprived persons will uh, tend to commit 
more of those crimes. So that would suggest that the algorithm would then want to punish these people more and thereby avoid uh, more violence, etc., in the in the future. But does that maybe suggest then that there's something missing here in the sense that there's a retrospective dimension uh, to what to the question what to do about human error? Whereas it seems that you're for you're for uh, nothing revolution reform and architecture. They're all uh, forward looking. Yeah, that's what. That's, that's a great point. So let's stipulate. I, I don't know that this is true of the study I'm describing, but if it isn't true of it, it could certainly be true of it or another, where the algorithm in deciding, let's say, who, who's going to be imprisoned or even what sentence people are going to get is attuned to socioeconomic background. And let's suppose that uh, people of cert of uh, economic deprivation are less likely to be freed because they're more likely to do bad things. Uh, there is a kind of um, entrenching of inequality there. And that's a problem. It's connected with uh, one of the excellent points about algorithmic bias, let's call it. And uh, we talked a little bit about at lunch about what, what do you do with that? I think this is a fair question. Uh, the easy way out would be to say, well, maybe the algorithm trains on socioeconomic background, uh, but maybe it doesn't do that more than the judge. So maybe if we use the algorithm rather than the judge, we gain along the other dimensions and we lose nothing along that dimension. Uh, I think that's not satisfying you, and that's fair. So you might think, OK, uh, the fact that it's not worse than the judge doesn't mean it's good. It's still bad. So what do we do then? Do we then have, what, affirmative action for those of socioeconomically low status, meaning that even though their propensity to commit crime is statistically higher, they are not going to suffer statistically more? There's a trade-off there. Because you might do that, and it might be, along one dimension, a good thing to do. But let's suppose it's the case, as it predictably is, that people of low socioeconomic background, they commit, the crimes they commit are committed against people of low socioeconomic backgrounds. So the benefit you're providing by protecting them against the statistically justified action ends up hurting innocent people of, of low socioeconomic backgrounds. So there's a complicated trade-off. I don't know what the answer is. We discussed a little bit at lunch what the answer to the question, what do you do about that? And we couldn't solve it at lunch. But uh, it, it's a, it is a philosophical question as well as an economic question. It's a question of distributive justice. Any comments more from the panel? No? Any other questions? Um, my name is Trude Haugli. I'm a professor in law and member of the Holberg board. And I uh, really enjoy this uh, discussion. And my question is about um, human errors and the best interest of the child. I think there's, that's the field where you will see hu human errors um, frequently. I wonder, your um, friend, John Stuart Mill, mm -hmm. would he say that uh, the actor or the agents know best what is in his best interest if the agent is a child? That's the one question. And the other one is about machine uh, algorithm. Uh, do you think that could work in child custody cases to decide the best interest of the child? That's my questions. OK, this is fabulous. So. Um, I think Mill would be very cautious saying that the best interest of the child is something that um, any particular parent knows about. And the reason I think he'd be, he might end up with that conclusion, but I think he'd be cautious on the ground that his own arguments don't naturally transfer there. So suppose you are deciding how you're going to spend your vacation, assuming as I hope that you get one, uh, you probably have relative clarity about what vacation would be best for you. Um, but if you're deciding what vacation would be best for your child, it's not as clear. I mean, maybe you're closer to your child's 
interests in terms of your motivations and your knowledge than anyone else, but there's a distance. I say this as someone with a nine-year-old and a six-year-old whose reactions to the wonderful things I provide for them sometimes surprise me. I don't know. So, so there is a, 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 an epistemic separation there. Uh, in terms of the algorithm in a child custody dispute, um, bracketing, the, which is making it a little easy, but um, Matthias's good points, the algorithm, if it's a good algorithm, should know some things that human decision makers aren't likely to be able to figure out. Now, you want to know what the algorithm is trying to maximize. So if the algorithm is trying to maximize, say, let's educational opportunity for the child, that may not be the only thing that matters for the child. But an algorithm should be extremely helpful there. There's an interesting paper I referred to you on Elster. He has a, he has a paper and a book, I think, that's where the book, the lead essay in the book is about this, who says uh, in custody disputes on the best interests of the child, flip a coin. It's a very provocative conclusion. I hope most of you are thinking, no, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> the reason I hope that is that that is the natural response. They should flip a coin to decide who gets the custody. But what Elster's thinking is that the child custody disputes are often so painful and difficult. And the likelihood that you'll get the right answer is so speculative. that why not just flip a coin then there isn't a reduced likelihood of the right answer, and you reduce all the pain and the agitation and the uncertainty. So it, ha it has a logic. The algorithm might be like a more accurate coin flip. Also, if I, so there is actually, uh, so as in, in the US in February, we were actually at a presentation about a, a case. So using an, a machine learning system or I think an algorithm to assign homeless children um, to foster homes, given a limited amount of foster homes, given a min limited amount of foster families able to deal with children with trauma, and trying to find sort of the, the quote unquote correct or optimal uh, allocation of the children. And I think that it has actually been, I'm not sure if it was a, a proof of concept or actually being implemented, but so that could be an interesting case of that being uh, used. And of course, if and when that inevitably sooner or later does go wrong somewhere, so maybe someone does get assigned to a uh, either abusive family or a family that they can't handle it, because the system, you still get statistical flukes, then it becomes a question of sort of what is, is the perception of justice where maybe an algorithm isn't assigned the same um, it's not as if we feel like, well, someone made this on the basis of a reasoned judgment, perhaps they knew the, the host family, and they made the best case uh, call. Uh, it's easier to disagree with the machine judgment, perhaps. And in that sense, there is a literature on the, uh, yeah, the, the process, processable validity of using randomness in decision making uh, as well, as Cass mentioned. Uh, hi, my name is Christian Hoynes. I don't have an exciting bio, so I'll just skip that. Uh, but thank you all for very interesting talks and topics. My question deals with nudges in general. They seem to come with great power. And when the government is given the right to nudge, how does one ensure that nudges are pragmatic and not driven by ideology and short-term interests, as we appear to be seeing in many examples of in the current White House administration? OK, great. So um, I think th the answer to the question of what's the right constraint on nudges, if I'm not mistaken, was given by Max, which is democratic checks. So if you have a society in which the nudges are silly or evil, uh, the best safeguard is, is democracy itself. Um, I'd go a little bit further and say that uh, it's, useful to have a process for uh, public comment and scrutiny in advance of uh, instruments that governments use, whether it's a tax or a, a regulatory mandate or a nudge. I'd add just two points. One is that of the things that we worry about from governments, uh, the top of the list should be prohibitions 
and the n next very close should be mandates, and below should be taxes and penalties that are monetary, and then there's a bunch of stuff, and then there are nudges at the bottom. And the reason is that if you look at things that are terrible that governments do, uh, that really cause harm, mandates and bans are the tools of the authoritarian. If all that Adolf Hitler had was nudges, uh, Germany and the world would have been a lot better off. Um, the other point I make as a safeguard, which is not about democratic checks, is uh, I think a term which is next to algorithms is least likely to uh, be the thing under which people march on any day. Algorithms now, no one would march under. And, and you wouldn't say cost-benefit analysis, let's march. But uh, maybe let's do a moment of marching. And the idea would be that if the government is required to have some empirical foundation for all its instruments, including its nudges, by saying what it's, what it's gonna do and what it's gonna cost, that is, that's a really important safeguard. So uh, uh, something that may amuse you is the US government passed a law saying that food has to have, that has gen genetically modified ingredients ha that has to be labeled. And uh, the scientific consensus is that genetically modified food has no adverse effects on health or the environment. That's the consensus. Uh, so the U.S. government just recently did what it was required to do, which is to propose genetic li uh, labels for genetically modified food, and it said very candidly, this has no benefits. That was good, because it doesn't have any benefits, but they still had to do it. Now, some of you may be thinking that on the environmental front there's some disagreement. Uh, that's not false, but it's kind of the particular case is independent of the general point, which is if you're required to say if something has benefits or costs, that is a great discipline against error. If I may. Yes. Thanks. Just add in one more question, if I may, to um, what you uh, said exactly now about cost and benefit analysis um, in the context of courts. That's a very US legal reasoning mode, I would say. When we talk about a cost and benefit, we usually refer to um, efficiency or rationality. Reasonableness is something different. It usually is the basis where to ground uh, the decision, but not um, where to restrain any uh, remedy. So I was uh, wondering whether there is a perception among judges in the United States that uh, um, cost and benefit analysis are required, exactly as you were saying with regard to governments, because there is more legitimacy uh, uh, ensuing from there. That's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm stuck on your point about uh, whether cost-benefit itself is a, people who talk like I do with these, this barbaric accent, or whether it's more general than that. And um, you know, everything is so much in flux, and policies change over time. So uh, in European institutions, often cost-benefit analysis is, is favored as at least an ingredient in the analysis. Uh, in the courts, the, the, a reasonable view is that uh, cost-benefit is both too contentious and too complicated for something for judges to require. Um, there is some development in my country where if an agency imposes costs and can't identify benefits, it's acting arbitrarily or if an agency imposes something that has very high costs and very low benefits, it has to give an explanation. 
or, and this is something that the Trump administration has gotten in trouble for, if you have a policy that has high benefits and low costs and you don't do it, that's arbitrary. So there is some movement in the direction of uh, requiring at least some weighing and if feasible, some quantification. And uh, I, I, I expect that as we get better at coming up with numbers for things, uh, the judges will be increasingly comfortable with at least requiring a, a reasonable demonstration by reference to numbers that what they're doing makes sense. Now, you might be cautious about this on the ground that it's just too hard for judges to get a handle on it. And that might be true. But I bet you could think of a case where there's a health and safety regulation, which let's say it, uh, ministers here don't issue, and the benefits would be very high and the costs would be very low. And uh, those are key ingredients in the judge's, let's say, plausible decision that that's unreasonable. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Hans Nortet. I'm a, a professor here at the faculty. Um, this is very interesting for, or from him, from all of you. Um, but I have this question. Um, this nudges, how do you think they what is the difference between, uh, and I can see some of them, but I'd like you to, to say it, uh, between the, your nudges and institutional theory, that you want to change the institutions in, 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 in giving people uh, incentives to, to, to act in a specific way. Uh, and nudges, as I understand they're more particular, but, but uh, isn't it very much the same, the same thinking behind institutional theory like North or others to, to, to change the institutions in order to, to achieve a, a different um, uh, changing people's behavior in, in, and uh, changing nudges. And I have an additional question um, or a comment. Um, if the state means that acting in a sp particular way is the best, for example, driving not above 100 kilometers per hour, you shouldn't you just give a prohibition or like in Germany you have the freeways you can drive as fast as you will you can but if you are above 130 you you are more likely to get, to be liable if there's a accident i would say that if the german authorities think 130 is is a kind of threshold for the risk you should take maybe um, yeah, yeah. so the question is would um, using nudges be a um, kind of uh, making the authorities maybe sometimes just do nudges when they they should maybe have used the prohibition in order to to uh, to influence people's behavior. Okay, good. So th think of an, on the definitional point. Think of a nudge as uh, an intervention that fully preserves freedom of choice, but that also steers people's behavior in a certain direction. Um, by fully preserves freedom of choice we mean to exclude material incentives. So if there's a subsidy or a tax, it's, it's not a nudge. So if you arrange a grocery store so the healthy foods are at eye level, that's a nudge. If you impose a tax on sugary beverages, that, that's not a nudge. Uh, if you uh, inform workers that certain uses of equipment are, is risky, that, that's a nudge. If you uh, ban the equipment from being used in the workforce because it's too risky, that's, that's not a nudge. On institutional theory, I'm not sure exactly what's meant by that, but I think that's a much larger category of inquiries than the identification of a set of tools that are non-coercive uh, instruments of behavior change. That, that's the idea. In terms of whether for the speed limit we should have a, 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 
a spe specified number or a range, again, with a presumption that if you go over 130, you're uh, going to be subject to penalties, or with some word like prudent or reasonable, uh, we, have, we have two friends who can help us. Uh, the first friend is called decision costs, and the second friend is called error costs. These are our friends. Uh, we want to minimize decision costs and error costs in deciding what instrument to have. Uh, a, a clear rule, you can't go over 120 kilometers, imposes no decision costs. Everything's simple. Um, it might create error costs in the sense that there are a number of people who could go faster than that who would not be posing risks. And we'd want to know whether those error costs mean that you know a significant number of people are being forced to drive too slow when there wouldn't be a safety issue. Uh, with with the, the German solution, as you describe it, which is to say you can go as fast as you want. If you go over 130, there'll be a presumption of illegality or more likely to get in trouble. That increases decision costs because the system has uncertainty in it. Uh, it might reduce errors if there's no increase in accidents, let's say, and there is uh, an increase in inconvenience. So this is just a way of saying whether you want a simple rule or instead a standard or instead freedom, a nudge, we'd want to look at, at the uh, decisional burdens placed on the legal system and the number of mistakes that one or another approach introduces, both the number and the size of mistakes. There's one jurisdiction that introduced a speed limit rule called prudent and reasonable. It was a disaster. No one knew how fast they were supposed to go, and they crashed into each other a lot. OK. Uh, we have 10 minutes left. We have two people from the panel who would like to ask questions or comments. Mm -hmm. We start with you, Valgeria. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious. Uh, in one of the papers we read for the class, Jeremy Waldron's piece, he expressed some worries in terms of nudges, nudges uh, at least in the abstract. <laughs> and he spoke about competence, which we have been discussing, I think, with regard to human error. But he also spoke about dignity and trust. Would you care to comment on, on at least maybe the trust issue? No pressure. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's great. OK, so um, the pressure is, I feel a lot of pressure now. Um, so uh, there's a very uh, distinguished um, uh, philosopher, law professor named Wal Jeremy Waldron, who is very worried about uh, distrust and he's also very worried about infringements on dignity. Uh, both points are valuable. So let's talk about trust first. Uh, this morning and last night, uh, with a little, my sleep pattern was disturbed. So not through anyone's fault, just because the United States, we have the wrong time. It's hours different. <coughs> And so what, what is one to do? Work on an academic paper, yes? And the, the academic paper I have is, is called Trusting Nudges? Question mark, and it's based on new data from five countries, including in Europe, Denmark, and Germany. And what we try to do among nationally representative populations is to figure out when people don't like nudges, and major strong majorities do, but when they don't, why don't they? What's correlated? And the, the, the driving factor, the most important variable, is trust. So in Denmark, the, remember, slightly lower? It's because the trust levels are lower. So Waldron is completely right that in terms of public legitimacy, uh, for nudges and, and other instruments, I'm sure, uh, it's good to know, is the government trusted? And this, I think, is not just an empirical finding. It bears on democratic theory more generally, where to think about, and I was illuminated by the, on the data to work hard on the paper last night in particular, uh, forgive the autobiographical comment, but to think about tools of, of democratic legitimacy and their relationship to any policy instruments. So public participation, 
uh, elicitation of public concerns, response to public concerns, respectful engagement with public concerns, change in response to justified public concerns, those need to have a stronger place in the repertoire of legal thinking, I think, than they've, they've had to date. Uh, on dignity, um, Professor Waldron, who's one of, one of the great, I think, legal philosophers of our time, uh, is um, very agitated about the insult to dignity, which he thinks some nudging might produce. Um, uh, uh, do you know William Blake, the English poet? William Blake is a great English poet. And he wrote at a time, he was an artist also, and he wrote at a time when the most famous artist in England was Sir Joshua Reynolds. It wasn't Sir William Blake, just William Blake, but it was Sir Joshua Reynolds. Blake did not like Reynolds. And the, Reynolds gave these great lectures on art. This is not a diversion. This is not because the pressure is so intense. Uh, 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 Reynolds wrote about art is all about generalization and abstraction. And the purpose of great art is to be very abstract in general. And Blake wrote in the margin, just handwriting, it was preserved, he wrote, to generalize is to be an idiot. To particularize is the alone distinction of true merit. I thank God I am not like Reynolds. Now, I love that. And the reason I love that that's relevant here is to be worried about dignity is very good in the abstract. Is it an insult to dignity to tell people that if they don't pay their credit card bill this month, they will have to pay a late fee? Is it an insult to people to inform them of the risks associated with the medicine they're using? Is it an insult to people's dignity to tell them that smoking is very dangerous? Is people's dignity compromised if they're automatically enrolled in a savings plan? It's hard, I think, to say the answer is yes. So the question is, what particular interventions of what kind actually intrude on human dignity? And there are plenty of them, but particular, to particularize is the alone distinction of true merit. Yes, um, roughly speaking, you can act to either improve your own life or you can improve the lives of others. And the libertarian paternalism is all about improving your own life. So the question is, can nudges or libertarian tools, whatever, um, improve the life of others? Should we use nudges to, for this purpose? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, there's a terrific paper by a Swedish, I think she's, a banker now, uh, called Anna Brennan, which is called Give More Tomorrow. And the idea is that employers should consider, uh, or charities, enrolling people in programs by which they give more of their future income to charity. Give more tomorrow. And she not only described the idea, she implemented it, and it worked. And that's a way of, liber a libertarian way of promoting, um, helping others. You can see automatic enrollment in green energy. I was told that in Germany, uh, a very large number of electricity providers automatically enroll you in green energy. Now, if you don't want green energy, you can opt out. And green energy is often a little more expensive, but you're automatically in. That's libertarian, but it's to protect harm to others. So I, I, this is a fantastic question about tools we could adopt, and we could do them you know, tomorrow. Uh, I'm thinking I should more than I have. Yeah. But uh, I'll tell you a funny story in a moment. But uh, to have choice-preserving mechanisms, which we use individually or which our institutions use that help third parties. Here's my little story that I have a charity that I very much like. It's called Give Directly, where it gives money directly to poor people in Africa. It just shows up on their cell phones, the money. It's a very effective charity, and it's been empirically uh, vindicated. So I went on to give some money to them, and 
I, I meant to give some relatively small amount, but not, not nothing. And, and after I did it, I said, oh, did I do it one time or do, did I do it monthly? And, oh my God, I did it monthly. I didn't mean to give a, a non trivial amount every month. And then I looked back on the website and said, why did I do that? And it's because the default setting <laughs> is to give monthly rather than just once, and I fell for the default. And then once I had done that, I thought, do I take it back? <laughs> no, I can't take the money away. So I fell doubly victim to behavioral biases. And I'm so glad I did. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of this session. I want to thank all six of you for preparing wonderful uh, papers and especially to Professor Sunstein and his illuminating insights to everything that came up here on the podium and in the audience. I want to thank you all for uh, making this a special event. But before uh, you applaud and relieve them from their pressures on stage, uh, I want to uh, nudge you all to come to the University Aula tomorrow. It starts at 9. It's the Holberg Symposium uh, on Democracy and Truth. So it will have four wonderful uh, presentations by invited guests by Professor Sunstein. And then, of course, at 2 o'clock, his Holberg Lecture. So again, thank you all, and we all hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs>